very quickly go down the line and do some introductions. So if you'd like to start this end. Yeah, I'm Paul Massey. Uh, I'm a founder and director of uh, Big Room Software. We do um, embedding software, so obviously that software that goes in medical devices and the like. Hi, I'm Tori Baker. Um, I'm a founding partner for Decoding Digital as we launched to market. Um, I've been in digital and technology for a good 20 years, so a fountain of knowledge. And if you want to tap me, please do. <laughs> Any questions? Hi, I'm uh, Toby Parkins. Um, I made a marble machine at primary school and managed to win all the marbles in the school, nearly. Um, <laughs> that was my first business. Um, since then, I've, I've, I've set up some tech companies. Um, I'm currently running Head Forwards, um, also chair of Tech Southwest, set up Agile B, um, used to stuff with software Cornwall and Cornwall Chamber of Commerce. Um, I'll stop there, I can't remember those. <laughs> <laughs> and you guys talked a little bit earlier, so Caitlin and Paul, I met Blue Fruit Software as well, um, and I've got a background not only in tech, but also in supporting kind of growth for startups and tech businesses as well, so understanding to grow clients, products, basically make money. What an esteemed panel we have. So overcoming tech challenges is the theme here. Yeah? I think it's important that we define exactly what a tech challenge is in order to solve the problem. Um, so would anybody like to give a definition of what a tech challenge is and what it means to them? Who would like to start us off on that? Should, should we start with what it isn't? What isn't it? Because that might lead us to what it is. And, you know, I think when I say what it isn't, I mean, um, simply obtuse, simply because people quite often go, hey, tech, yeah, uh, I found out, I've read about some tech, I've read about AI or big data or any of these sort of buzz terms. And then they go, right, we need to use this tech in our business. And then they go and try and find um, a, a solution. For that they're going to fit this tech, in, you know, they're going to use the tech to build a solution, and then they realise that actually, before finding a solution, you've actually got to find a problem. So they go and try and find a problem that they can provide a solution with, so they can use some tech. And actually, I think sometimes tech challenges actually are sort of created just because people think that they need to have some tech. And it's really important to focus on let's identify a business challenge or a problem first, and then. Work, work that way. That wasn't the answer you were looking for, was it? No, it wasn't anywhere near. Anybody got anything to add to that? I'll try to. So, uh, from my perspective, you can automate anything via technology. And to iterate what Toby said in some rights, there's, there's an element of when you go to automate something, is there value to automate it? What does it really mean? What does it mean to my business? What does it mean to my customers? What does it mean to you? what I'm trying to solve? And I guess when you understand that value, then anything can becomes enabled by technology, but just doing technology for technology's sake, I've seen a lot of businesses fail, um, just throwing things at things for no reason or thinking they should do that, but about the core understanding of the problem, the value, and what it really means. I guess maybe you um, absolutely agree with what's been said, and uh, uh, to, to kind of work your way back as a kind of solution, ahead of that has been that kind of challenge. Ahead of that has maybe been opportunity, um, so we might have started with some sort of business case of opportunity and that, that might be a money saving opportunity for the NHS or it may be uh, just a business opportunity uh, and then you try and progress that and you may have hit some impediments, technological impediments to, to uh, realising that opportunity and, uh, and that's a sort of tech challenge, you have your problem and then, then you can start looking, doing some discovery work uh, to, to, to find what a good solution might be. Yeah, I think for me, tech is just a tool. And so most tech challenges are because people are trying to use a tool that they don't understand, or they're potentially using it in the wrong way, or using it for the wrong thing. So if they're having a challenge with using technology, oftentimes it's just needing to better possibly understand that tool. Um, does that come through the discovery phase or something else along the process? So some of it's discovery, some of it's experimentation. <clears throat> um, a lot of us here believe in Lean Agile. The reason we like that is because it gives you a chance to play with the tool. If you think back when you are a kid and you were first learning technology, you learn how to use technology by using it. 
my six-year-old can connect the computer and the phone to the Wi-Fi because he's had to figure out how to do it when he wanted to get onto his games. Uh, no one taught him that, he's just playing and experimenting and using it. So you have to kind of remember how we learn to use technology technology in a native way and then apply that to how we're doing it at work. Can you think of any contexts in work where that experimentation could happen outside of a business critical project perhaps? Yeah, so I mean I think um, there's that question around business critical. <laughs> you know, it depends on which part of it is critical and how much of it you release out. So again, you know, a, a lot of with Lean Agile and a lot of the stuff we do for clients, they'll do a lot of development and experimentation and trying things out. Um, and it's okay if it fails because it's still within what they're doing. So it's all right. It's just making sure that you experiment enough in-house before you release it out to the public, before they see all the mistakes. And even then, who cares? Then you, as long as you're being careful. Sorry, I think compliance and everything like not killing people. Um, but you should be learning, right? You should be constantly learning when this, when you're doing this stuff. So business critical depends on how big the consequence is of making that mistake, and then working backwards from there and figuring out how much you can experiment within that. I love that blue fruit seed death as uh, critical. <laughs> we work on medical devices, so we have to be careful, right? There's a certain line of quality you can't cross. Um, I'm happy to try it. Um, I, with that business critical thing, I think you've done brilliantly. Okay, we've spoken about there's there's no reason why you can't run things in tandem. There's no reason why you can't continuously test, continuously iterate. If you're not doing that, you're never going to learn. And if you're not learning, you're never going to solve the problems that you currently have. So there's no harm in trying. But there's no running a standard process next to a digital process. Brilliant because then you can start to measure the benefit of one versus the other. You can start to realise the potential of one versus the other. And you can start to get people to learn to switch and to kind of take their place in that change. It's probably one of the biggest tech challenges we all face is actual change. So adapting to that change, creating a new process, um, delivering that change with soft skills, um, people understanding their role in that change and what it really means to them. And they're probably bigger challenges than the technology or the automation or the processes or other parts than anything else at a lot of times. So testing in tandem is a brilliant idea. The more you do that, the more benefit it will bring to your businesses. Do you think that um, businesses would see value in including something like Google's 10% time? So 10% of the work can be spent on experimentation? Do you know, I've worked in many businesses that used to give a day away. Um, so we've been a sprint, so we're talking about agile sprints, maybe a week sprint that we might be working towards or two weeks. We would always try and cushion some time. In Parliament, we did 20% time. But it always, certain individuals and certain roles can free themselves to have that time where other people wanted that time. So developers could be free and kind of get their ideas down, but people in finance or administration couldn't quite get the time or they were too locked down on the business as usual, the kind of standard processes. So in some rights, I would love to say, yes, yes, the more the better, but it's very hard to find time when your, I guess your revenue is critical, um, what that really means to you. And there has to be an element of quality almost in that. Yeah. I mean, 10% time is a really interesting one because as somebody described it to me, it's like, yeah, no, it's a brilliant idea. So at Google, you work 20% longer hours than you would normally and you get 10% time. Um, so, <laughs> right, okay. That's, that's, that's kind of like, great, isn't it? Yeah, I'll, I'll do that. For all my staff, it's compulsory. Um, you know, which isn't necessarily the right way round. You know, the, what, with 10% time, and that's the sort of principle about allowing people to innovate and Discover. I think, you know, ultimately, um, it, if you take, say, the Valve model, where people can, you know, decide to move teams, can make up their own salary, or the team makes up people's salary, you know, you, you have this sort of ultra um, flat models of um, empowered individual and team empowerment and things. You know, the the principle there is actually that you've got to add more value in by doing something. So if you have ten percent time and you can demonstrate that during that innovation you end up adding more than 10% or 11%, whatever, whichever way around you want to do the sums. You know, if you can do, if you can produce more business value and productivity uh, by having that 10% time, then it's a no-brainer, isn't it? But the challenge is, is that how do you really measure that? How do you measure that? It's a lot of it's subjective. 
sometimes in order, you know, I'm not saying this has ever happened, but I've seen it, seen it certainly more times than I can remember, you know, people sort of try and justify, come up with some elaborate reason why they want to sort of, you know, create this sort of cool, funky model of X, Y, and Z. And they sort of come up with some sort of justification for it. And then, in effect, falsify the, the goal and the, the targets to justify why they just, you know, spend 10% of time on, you know, achieving actually something that doesn't really actually have any value. Um, instead of just saying, oh, uh, hands up, yeah, we tried it. Uh, it didn't work that time, but, you know, oh well, let's try something else. Where, in summary, where I've seen it work really well is where people have actually put forward a business justification for what they're going to do in their 10% of time. So it's been related to the productivity of the company that are paying their wages. That's quite handy because it's more, you're more likely to deliver business value as opposed to going off and doing a, a, you know, a project, you know, measuring giraffes in Africa, which may have some significance what you're doing in business, but may not. Um, actually, we've, we've got an example where we might be getting some value out of a similar project to that. But, you know, ultimately, trying to allow people to have ownership of their 10% time and to really understand that it has to deliver business productivity and value, that makes it you know, a lot easier to um, achieve. Just going to throw it out there, if anybody needs giraffes measured, just let me know. <laughs> and so let's open that up to you, amazing folks. Have you got any questions for our Overcoming Tech Challenge panel? Gary, to start with. Yeah, I just want to pick up on the, the uh, conversation around kind of 10% time, and as you mentioned back, obviously, you know, games or something like that, model quite well. I just wanted to capture the panel's views on, okay, so if you make it that it builds the business, you know, if you look at 10% time or where their flat structures, like they do completely flat. But the problem they have as a business, and I'm sure this comes up across the world, everyone's motivated by making more money. So that instead, they're not looking at the users because ultimately they see it as a lottery if they're tied to an incentive based on that. So if they can say, okay, we're going to make a lot more money, we're going to, uh, you're going to get your bonus, and that's what we're tied to. I just wanted to know how you would see rewarding those staff members for making a breakthrough that isn't necessarily always tied to money, and it's more towards the user, because that's something that those companies massively struggle with, um, and if there is something on that side. So, so with that, it's quite, you know, the, I, I, you know, you have a, like a team will sort of approve each other's salaries, you know, that type of thing. So actually you get people sort of saying, well, okay, somebody's contribution may be brilliant in terms of how it's enhanced the rest of the team, how it's improved mm -hmm. morale, all sorts of things that are not necessarily measured by financial bottom lines, but people can make that sort of um, objective decision yeah. collectively to actually reward people in, in a way that isn't necessarily tied to financial so lines. Well, one problem they find from, from the outside of it, it's quite a close company, and they do do flat the most, so it's kind of good to look at them. But one thing they tend to find is that it's time to innovation as well, because nothing ever gets out. Because they build this thing, they spend some time making it. Everyone goes to pass the on the back, but then business is going to go, this is actually going to make us any money, or are we just going to carry on doing the same thing that we've always done? And they can now find themselves in a position where they're losing their competitive edge. So I just wanted to, I, I just, it's more just like a discussion of, you know, what additional motivations can you give to those staff members to actually spend that time working with beyond the money? Because so I, I think related to that, it's trying to remember what the purpose of that time is for. So I talked earlier about all those interesting tech things that are coming up right now, the trends, and it's a chance to get to play a little bit with some of those to better understand things that might impact your business in the future. Then that has added value for future knowledge of something that you might not be able to directly sell right now, but if you're getting to experiment and play a little bit with some of that technology, it just inspires your team to think about how they might be able to incorporate that into their project. So like, for example, on our software teams, we've been talking about AI and things like that, and I had a software engineer come and say to me, oh, you're never going to be an AI company. And I said, of course not. I'm not an AI company. We're an embedded software company. But we might use AI in embedded software. So getting a chance to play with stuff and kind of experiment with it, it can adjust how they do the day-to-day -day job better, um, or they can decide not to. But what we have done as well with a few of our internal projects that we've spent some of our spare time on 
is they become training products for people. So we've made some things. Um, so usually we seem to steer towards synthesizers, which don't have a huge return on investment for market value. There's other people that do them better in Cornwall. Um, but it's good for training. It's something that we can build and then people can play with it and we can teach embedded engineering on something that we own. We have the IP of, we built ourselves, they can play with it. If they break it, it's not the client's thing. So it's really good for that early stage learning. So that does have intrinsic value to us. Um, and if someday we want to commercialize it, great. So does that come down to take the example of AI in your team? Would that come down from leadership or would that come from them? Because I think that's the problem. It's, it's often difficult when you're in the middle of it to step back and go, what do I want to work on when I'm actually in the middle of the spring? So do you set that kind of, okay, we want, for the next three months, we want to explore, use that time to explore this space. Is that coming out of the leadership? So we have a real open, um, we use Slack a lot internally. Um, we've got a learning channel. People post a lot of stuff that they're interested in. Um, Paul will maybe mention, hey, there's this course that I've seen that people can engage in. And then it's kind of self-organizing around what things that they're interested in. We might suggest stuff, but you can't force people to experiment or play with things that they're not that into, um, or it suddenly stops being fun and exploring, and it starts being just more work. Um, can I just add a point there? So there is um, ways to reward for creating um, value back in your business. And so there's a governmental dividend that you can give to one of your staff members up to a five grand reward each time by actually making savings within your business. Um, their savings in your business, if they unlock £10,000 worth of savings, you can still only give them £5,000. If they only unlock £3,000 worth of value in your business, you can only give them £3,000. But it's that ability to have a conversation in the way that if people are delivering value and are invested in your business and driving value by your business by creating change, you can financially reward them. So it does give you some benefit or ways that you can engage yourself and create some form of scheme that might benefit. I think I think leadership does play a key role as well. There's, there's no uh, attention between uh, uh, good leadership and empowerment. So people can be empowered, we can consent time, but leadership within the organisation can ins inspire a team into uh, towards goals which are aligned with the business as well. So we've got some people who work with like kind of in the main time we've been playing around with some sort of uh, image recognition, machine learning and stuff and you know that's led to a really interesting app that I'm not going to tell you about actually because it would be something pretty cool with it too. And then there's another little project um, where we're trying to help um, identify seals around the coast of Cornwall. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of, there's about 50,000 photographs of seals or 50,000 seals in photographs of like that. Um, and so we're helping the um, wildlife project to try and do seal recognition using image. Um, and you know, we've had somebody, um, so that's part of the Microsoft um, environment project. And um, a lot of people went to, I think, the conference uh, early on this month, um, early on in October in Seattle, I guess, um, to, to sort of share some ideas on that. And, and, and that's like kind of, wow, this is really cool. It's not giraffes, but you know, seals. It's called a giraffe. Um, so, but you know, this sort of like kind of well, where's the ROI of that? It's like, well, actually, we're now using that some of the learnings from that in an app which we delivered um, at fifty-five percent of the estimated budget, um, a proof of concept app to that then was demoed to the head of uh, Red Bull Marketing at the Monte Grand Prix, and who loves it, and Grand Prix, uh, Formula One now wants to use it, and. Simon Cow happened to be there and is interested in using it for X Factor and, and it's currently being built into a film a launch or something. Um, but you know, there's this kind of, you, you, you do some experimentation or in a, you know, and then all of a sudden you can use that in a completely different area. We would we never thought that it would have anything to do with X Factor, you know, but you know, the, 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 the kind of opportunities if you, you do sort of think, Interestingly, that didn't come through 10% time. That came through individuals that had a huge desire to explore and innovate. And yes, when they started to sort of kind of say, oh, what about this, what about that? Then as a company, we have supported that. Um, but we didn't just say, hey, everybody just have 10% time and see what we come up with. 
you know, it actually started with people with a desire to explore new technologies that they weren't familiar with. And I think that's, you know, having people, if people have got that drive, then as companies we should be supporting it. Um, if you just let everyone just go out and play with flowers, you know, it's not necessarily going to produce great results. I think, I know there's some more questions. I think you brought up an interesting point, though, in terms of uh, tapping into what people are passionate about. So taking it away. We're obviously, we've all got tech companies, we've got people that work in tech. When they play in their spare time, they're building like neural networks powered by lemons. When you're not in a tech company, um, what you've got to look for when you're coping with tech challenges and adapting to tech challenges is who is in that company that might help you do that. So I had an instance where when I was working in the public sector and I needed somebody to do our social media stuff and I happened to talk to somebody and I realized she was really into data and she really liked data. That wasn't her job at all. She was managing uh, fund distribution or something like that and she was particularly excited, thrilled, or passionate about what she was doing. She was doing a great job at it. You know, it was like kind of boring. So I gave her our social media feed to play with. I worked with her on it first, it was fine. Um, and suddenly she got super excited, she got really engaged, she was really proactive on it. Then we started thinking about making databases and we started to, so it was that thing when we had this untapped talent within the company that just because she wasn't in the job that was allowing her to do that, it meant that nobody realized how powerful she could be. And so that was something where we could get through the kind of, again, the technical challenges of incorporating some of that stuff, not by hiring externally or bringing in experts, but just by looking internally at what things are interest, people are interested in and then allowing them to do it. Um, and again, to the business critical side of things, she started on small stuff, proved that she could do it, and then we open to that. And is there any other questions? We're talking about a 10% model. What other models do the panel know about to for businesses to adopt to find these problems? So with one of our clients, um, so we've got a client who are, um, we're not allowed to talk about on camera, but they're one of the biggest insurance companies in the world. Um, and also work, um, also work with healthcare, and we find we do um, uh, what they call DPD days. So DPD as in um, ship it in twenty four hours. So it, the idea is is that um, and everyone within the sort of development teams comes up with some idea that could produce some value um, for that you know for for the company. Um, and then, you know, they've got 24 hours to sort of create it and produce a proof of concept <coughs> and then ship it, basically, deliver that to, for everyone else to see. Um, they only expect to, work, to do it in a day. If they want to finish it off in the evening, they, you know, they can. But, um, and that's produced some amazing results. So, um, be careful what I say here. So, again, actually using an image recognition and machine learning, we managed to and improve the, um, some of the internal systems um, which you know, save six figure sum each year for, for the organisation just by going, oh, what about, you know, and it was the developers who were working on like the, the workflow system for this, very, you, know, 2000, you know, 2,000 users using a workflow system could actually spot, actually, I can see where we can use an innovative piece of technology to um, streamline that whole process, which would actually save about three people's worth of effort per year. Um, you know, and that was just from, and they do that twice a year, I think, that kind of thing. Yeah, I've heard about that model before as well. I know the company I used to work for, they tried it first for the day, and then as they grew, and then they had teams in other countries that then brought it into um, a week to two weeks, so they do like a full sprint at the start of it. Um, different teams across the different companies all broke out around which problem they wanted to solve. So it meant that we got to mix up teams, we got to work with people we didn't get to work with every day, um, and we picked a number of the business challenges within the company. And it did everything from we need more videos. Cool, all right, let's do 50 videos in two days. And we got the people that could do it to just do 
fast 50 or 30 second videos. Um, somebody else worked on improving the website, somebody else worked on building the tool. Um, but they got to decide which projects they wanted to work on, they got to play with it, they self-organized their own teams, and it was just basically that the company facilitated it um, and kind of supported it, and it was time that was intentionally set aside to play. Um, with some of our clients I know have done design sprints as well, and taken that model. Um, we talked earlier about an increase um, commonness of uh, remote working, with everybody doing remote working and stuff. I've seen companies that are purely 100% remote and all consultants um, also coming together for a week where they'll work on an internal project without any goal of an outcome, but just purely to remind themselves of who each other are and to like catch up and say hi. Um, so, and they ended up building stuff that they could use it like scanned. Um, but the goal was to reconnect communication-wise as well. Um, so a slightly different model. Um, so um, in my time in Parliament, we, we were struggling to engage different heads of different departments, and it was a very wide organisation. And what we realised is we were deploying Agile and trying to get teams to cross horizontally work and form. That actually we, we used diversity, diversity of thinking around single point problems. So we had individuals coming in, throwing a problem at a team, and then having a whole team around them that could then brainstorm and work on the independent parts of it. And then within a couple of hours, we had a solution. And it's that kind of quick, rapid fire by diverse thinking. So individuals can bring great ideas, but multitudes of individuals of all different perspectives create better ideas. They create full understanding, full scope, full and we were giving that just away just to ensure that we engage with people, but also got the teams to work in different ways together. Otherwise, we found there were silos forming, as traditionally with big organisations they do. So breaking down those barriers and giving time back to individuals not only increased our propensity, but it enabled other people to get excited about new opportunities. So in terms of models, the, following on from what I said earlier, you know, we, you've got to remember it's a bit like a, a sort of VC investment model. Most investments don't really pay back, but the odd investment achieves like a thousand times its, its actual cost. And so if, if you take, you know, in, in this um, client model where we and you know, the client sort of, you know, do a day, twice a year, on, on that sort of DPD, 24 hour ship it idea, you know, the actual ROI for one of those ideas was like a six-figure sum each year, right? The cost of the number of people doing that is somewhere between ten and fifteen thousand pounds a day. You know, is the cost of of their time. The the impact of that cost hopefully is more than ten to fifteen grand. Um, so, you know, let's say say twenty grand. I can say so. On that particular, you know, you can say, well, let's do five, four more of those days, and then we'll be breaking even. If the savings are 100 grand a year, then actually you can justify it really easy financially. Um, and then, the, you know, but you, you focus everyone around, you know, say, look, this is how much we've saved. This is how much marketing achievement we've gained. This is the value of all these things. So you can keep people business focused and business minded about it, but at the same time, allow people to get quite to think very separately um, around it. And, and ultimately, when you've got to say to the board, you know, yeah, yeah, everyone's just playing today, um, you've got to, have, you know, some, somebody's going to ask the financial question. And if you can give a valid financial answer to that, that still allows everyone to get on and um, think very diversely and innovatively, then that, you know, I think that's a, that's, that's a workable solution that, you know, everybody, board level down, will actually agree with. Has anybody tried to play on scale metrics of 10% time? <laughs> <laughs> no. So you do for that. We've got a like a client, a company that we work with in um, Germany. They do. They allow for a lot of time to play. They have <coughs> so much Lego. Yeah. It's insane. Um, and 3D printers and things like that. But they have built because they've got it all around to play with. When they want to build out a product that they need as a prototype for they can use Lego and then they can 3D print the pieces that they don't have to be able to build it to do the functionality that they want, just as they kind of prototype. So a lot of play can end up being the things that you need to just have that little push beyond where you were. I think there's uh, sort of deliberate techniques as well as kind of models. So um, Dan, we talked a bit later about UX type stuff, so you know, speaking to users, understanding 
um, pain points, gain points. I think it's a good way of discovering opportunities on the business side of things. There's some techniques as well, like value stream mapping, or you know, where you can find opportunities within businesses which ultimately are going to lead to uh, funding projects and, and, and find problems and then use of some of these, these approaches to then find the best solutions to those problems. But um, I think uh, it, it's easy to find uh, uh, problems which aren't well funded, should we say, <laughs> um, which don't have a good business case behind them. So I think that sort of deliberate approach to finding, and it you know, depends what sort of business you're talking about. We're talking about a large corporation which is looking for uh, ways to improve efficiency or effectiveness, or maybe a, a small business looking for um, you know, the next area to diversify into and there's, there's different techniques, but I think you can get quite deliberate about finding these opportunities. So we've got two minutes for lunch, so I'm going to throw a rapid fire question at you, just because it's come up so many times. Given that this is a panel about overcoming tech challenges, you've actually mentioned people more than technology. Um, is that a real challenge when it comes to digital transformation? And how do you get an audience who's been using her dot matrix principle the last 50 years to transform into a different project? So there's some key drivers to change or uh, technology change. And to me, they are around the strategy, they're around leadership, they're around skills, they're around communication, and some other aspects. And they're, they're all human, they're all human factors. But they, their effect and cause and consequence on everything else you do is astronomical. Mm. So if you do not get your key drivers right or kind of align or kind of build towards those, you, you could go off and do a CRM tomorrow and it won't work for it because you won't deliver it. Somebody leaves, it won't be there. They have the skills to deliver it and not communicating that change to the team and so on. So the pink squishy bit is the most important part of the foundations of what that becomes. And they're also around what you design around also. So your users, your, your customers, your so you, you cannot remove the pink squishy bit from digital. Um, it just enables the pink squishy bit to do more. And that's, that's incredibly important. And I think probably change and investment is almost double to three times what you spend on your technology. And if you're not spending that, then you're not doing it correctly. Because actually you're not reaping the benefits or the value or the potential of those benefits in the future. And you might end up wasting your investment in time. So the pink squishy thing to me is very important. <laughs> You're not talking about their shrimp suits, are you? I know. <laughs> <laughs> Any more comments on that point? Um, I think ultimately it's important to take a step back and remember that like, it's just a tool for people, made by people, to sell to people, so you can't remove people. Um, for now, at least, until like the robot overlords come in, that's all it is. So if you ignore the people, then what the heck are you doing it for in the first place? And if you ignore the people that have to execute it and deliver it, then it's not possible. So I don't think you can divorce technology from people. Okay. Yeah, I mean, essentially what you're trying to achieve is um, a change in human behavior. And the behaviors are, I mean, the behaviors between people. Um, and therefore you cannot underestimate the value of coaching or facilitation um, or and that's unfortunately what a lot of um, less experienced organizations do they just think oh it's technology we just need some developers right let's we you know we've sacked a, um, a multi-billion dollar turnover client recently simply because they just thought they had a change in global direction and they restructured and the people who then started dealing with, having taken them through some sort of agile transformation, they uh, then went back 30 years and um, you know just went down to no it's just about developers, you know, and it's like the whole thing just fell apart and we just gave them notice. I mean it's just really sad to see when companies literally go back 30 years but you know <laughs> uh, final words on that one. Uh, no, I just concur really that it is about people. Um, the technology is really the easy bit. Um, and uh, to make a project a success, it's really about getting the, the people aspect of the project right. Okay, can I just follow up on that? Of course, you can. Um, just thinking about it in terms of the skills agenda, whether that aspect is considered enough in the development of the future talent that will populate these industries, and also interested from two of the biggest companies, tech companies in Colombia, 
how you've structured your organisation or how you operate the organisation to deal with the pin squishy day? So the principle about self-organising teams, I think it's really important. Um, empowering those teams, um, the role of facilitation and coaching within. So, and that has to be um, explicitly built into that. What that means is that I haven't got a clue what any of our teams are doing today. Um, I really don't need to because actually they're, they're getting on and doing some good stuff. And you know, it, it allows you to have a far flatter structure as a result. I say flatter, not flat. People quite often mis misunderstand what flat means um, or flatter means. But that principle about empowering and self-organising teams is that's the critical thing. And then you just those teams, right? They've got the right coaching balance and delivery balance. Then that you know they'll do the right thing. 95% of the time. And that's mm -hmm. 95 to tell you what, if people do the right thing 95% of the time, that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. You know, anything more than that, they're not taking enough risks. I think there's some short answer to your question about skills, is that we're not, you know, either the county or the country, or even globally really, we're not nearly doing enough in terms of the skills or fine with this. I think you know, that end businesses have uh, exploited that opportunity because we, we create those teams and fill that gap so businesses come to work because we can't create their own teams because of the, the, the global shortages in those skills. Uh, so um, yeah, I think there's a lot of work to do. I think some of the challenges is also not remembering that we're trying to talk to people so, and especially we're trying to build up digital skills for the future. We sit there and we go, look, technology is awesome. And we forget sometimes we're talking to children when we're trying to inspire them to get interested in technology. So they're surrounded by technology. They know technology is awesome. But do they know why it's important to them? Do, are we talking to them? Are we talking in their languages? Are we inspiring them in the ways that they want to be inspired? Are we getting them to be interested in it in the way that we want to? Um, and you can easily jump from children to clients. Um, not only that, but are you taking the time to understand your clients? Are you translating, we're really guilty of tech speak in our sector? Are we making sure that we understand their problems, we're translating it in common language that they can understand so they can get as excited <coughs> about what we see the potential to be? Um, and they follow along with it, they come along on the journey with us. Um, I think the biggest thing globally technology has a problem with is we're not taking everyone along with us. We're saying all these buzzwords, we've got news about AI, but nobody's taking the time to explain to people in common languages about what that means, how it's impacting them. Um, and because we're not taking the time to do that, the people that get technology can take advantage of it. Um, but also we're closing it down. We're not letting enough people come in, we're not giving enough creative ideas, we're not giving enough diversity because we've locked it down behind these really unnecessarily complex words and terminology and ideas. Whereas actually if we open it up, we simplify it, we allow more people in, we won't have as big of a recruitment problem, we'll get more diversity, and maybe we don't have people like Cambridge Analytica manipulating populations. Not to go into weird tension. I just had a, a couple of quick points and it's really sweet to reiterate and kind of, um, I guess, move on from some of the points here. And so we took a big interest, the reason why we called ourselves the Coding Digital is we believe digital is non-accessible. It's non-accessible in terms of cost, in terms of language, in terms of multitudes of other factors. And uh, digital, so companies with digital skills are SMEs with digital skills. Um, if they have digital skill tools, uh, financial products, and they move towards cloud-based IT, they see a 74% uplift in their income potential as a business. And that's a huge difference of when things become uh, no longer optional, people become, it becomes accessible, um, it, um, and there's a lot more going on in there. But it's also there's a lot of goodwill at the moment as the new digital inclusion strategy for Cornwall starts to launch. I guess we start to mirror the southwest, uh, heart of the southwest, and look at our road initiatives. There's good investment in the skills initiatives and funding available for small businesses today to start to look to take on that journey. But if we start there and start moving and actually build towards that as a county um, and as an area and in, into the southwest, I think we could be a formidable sector with digital and our opportunities with action on it increase. Um, so making that accessible, uh, making that um, 
decoding the language, taking it away from the CTO language, the CIO language, the, the inaccessible language will only start to add momentum. And I, I build for it. I build that everyone has the same opportunity to see it Final point to take. So just finally, I mean, to add on to all of that, um, I think what we saw with like infrastructure technology um, during the Supercast formal program, everyone kind of gets that. Oh, okay, we put the infrastructure, digital infrastructure, we enable like, you know, 95, 80, 95, whatever, 99% of the population to have really good internet, except for those who don't, I'm oh, sorry, <laughs> um, but most of the time people have got pretty damn good you know, connectivity in Cornwall, and, and, and that's uh, having a huge impact, you know, and you can, uh, people, everyone gets that, right? The next phase is to focus around skills and people. And if we can enable skills and people across the whole population, 99% of the population, just like we can with infrastructure, then, then actually, you know, as, as a region, we're, we're going to start delivering huge opportunities. And, and that's very easy to say, and it's incredibly hard to do, because actually out there in the population, when you, you know, I played pool the other day with a guy who was chuffed a bit, so he was just about to start work at Tulip um, yesterday morning, 6 o'clock shift, um, nine pound an hour, best pay he had for forever. And you know, he, I didn't talk to him about digital transformation or anything. Um, but I know that somebody like that, if they, and there's somebody else I met the other day who was, um, you know, was really, we were started talking about chess and stuff, and actually he's uh, um, re really found, found Python quite easy. And uh, built his own Raspberry Pi, and I was like, oh, bloody hell, I need to give you a job. Like, um, <laughs> what, what, what are you doing at the moment? Oh, I work in Abattoir. Um, right, okay, brilliant. Um, have you thought about digital? Mm, uh, well, sort of, yeah, it's quite easy, isn't it? I just now got into it. <laughs> um, and, and the kind of aspiration there. And this, this room here, um, a few months ago, was rammed. You couldn't fit any more people in this room, right? Because there, there was a talk about reopening the South property. And the passion people have for mining in this area um, and, and across Cornwall is, is, is huge. And the interest that that generates, the reason why I mention that is because there is actually a potential project coming forward called the UK Mining Centre of Excellence, which is actually looking to create real skills around mining, again, in, in this area. And that's even more interesting when you think about mining it isn't about yellow helmets and a lamp. Um, mining, you don't put people underground so much anymore because people, they might die. And that's quite, um, you know, quite expensive for the, for the people that own the mine. And um, what you actually do is you're automating. So modern mining, the first thing you do with underground mining is you put a massive Wi-Fi network. Um, once you've got a Wi-Fi network in, then you can start putting in autonomous vehicles that are self-driving, that are doing. So when things are going bang and exploding and you know and underground, nobody is anywhere near that. It's all happening remotely. You know, you could actually have people here doing mining anywhere in the world remotely. Um, it's all using huge amounts of data, but you know, so the, the data analytics and AI capabilities of, of mining are huge. And I think that's potentially where we do have an opportunity to, to actually apply, to, to capture the wider population's um, interest and, and inspire and this, cause them to become um, inspired in a, a future that they can relate to because mining is you know, one of the best paid jobs. An average miner would earn the equivalent of over £100,000 a year by just literally putting a helmet on and going down underground. Obviously, few skills as well out there. Um, but people remember that and I think we just need to actually reimagine what um, the sort of industrial revolution um, was a hundred and something years ago for Cornwall and actually look at what that could be in the future. That's a very passionate point to uh, break for lunch. Can we have a huge round of applause for the